Welcome to the Time Out Coaching Podcast. Today, I'm going to talk to a rising star of British coaching. He is the youngest coach to win a professional to trophy, the BBL Cup in 2018, and has coached the Cheshire Phoenix BBL team for the past three and a half seasons. Please welcome Coach Ben Thomas. Thanks for having me, Coach. Um, I, you know, I'm happy to be, and I'm really uh, excited about all these podcasts that are coming out. You know, I'm learning a lot myself from them, so you know, I'm, I'm happy to to be involved. And thanks for the invitation. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, you know, like you've I've told you before, I've told a, the number of people, you know, it's really important to get a historical uh, uh, perspective of the game. But more importantly, we're doing this to inspire younger coaches. And there cannot be uh, a better story than yours, you know, a, a homegrown product that goes and wins big in, you know, in what is a really tough and competitive league. So let's start by, like we always do, and, and, and talk about what was your introduction to the, to the game of basketball yeah so um like most people i think you know you, your parent or your brother's pe uh, played basketball or your sister or, or something like that and no different for me so my dad played when he was younger and um, played uh, in in his high school funnily enough coached by mike burton um you know he, he was a good player i believe obviously i just gotta take his word for it you know he <laughs> likes to say how good he was every now and again um you know would never really play past junior basketball, um, but always sort of stayed involved with with the Jets being a local team for us. Like you, you'd always go and watch. And I think I must have been about nine or ten, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, he invited, you know, he took me to my first game, and um, that's when Billy Singleton was there. Um, I remember being stood in the corridor at the Northgate Arena as Billy Singleton walked past, just looking up at this absolute man mountain. And uh, yeah, they were sponsored by the Twiglets as well. I remember Twiglets getting yeah. thrown into the crowd at half time and all that sort of stuff. It was just, you know, a great experience. And I loved, I loved basketball from there on in, really. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And, and obviously, such a rich tradition and history, you know, when you're going to watch. Is that, did that, you know, that, that, that inspire you to start playing? I mean, obviously, you know, and, and the fact, talk to me just a little bit because there's not going to be that many coaches that we talk to British coaches I'm talking about who had that ability to go and sit so close I mean I, I loved the Northgate Arena I actually enjoyed playing there I had you know some really great games but it's yeah. you know you're right there you've got to feel players feel emotion feel the game talk to me a little bit about that yeah, I mean, you know, not many people liked playing at the Northgate and I don't think many Jets players enjoyed playing at the Northgate that much as well, if I'm honest. But as a fan, like you say, it's so small. Um, you know, the, the, the space between the bleachers and the court was was tiny. And, you know, the, the atmosphere in, in there was unbelievable. So, yeah, just being that close to them, you know, growing up in, in that environment and, you know, it, it, it is like, you know, like you say, inspiring at the time when you're young, you're getting to meet these these players after the game, you know, you got to go and shake their hands and get an autograph and it just, you know, lights that fire in your belly about just wanting to go back next week and then working on your game to, to try and be like them as well. So, yeah, that was definitely like a huge inspiration early on. So you, um, where, where did you, you were playing for the, for the Jets uh, junior teams or, you know, what about the yeah. school situation, you know, cause you did play for sure, you know? Yeah. So, um, the Jets back then never had a junior program attached to it. It was a little bit, a little bit different. So, um, the local team then was called Alzheimer's Port Panthers. Sure. And, you know, it was a pretty well-known program. I think it was more well-known for like the women's or the, or the girls' teams. They, they were very, very successful, you know. That, uh, that, all was, the lead, that, that was all Coach. The yeah, that was Jimmy McGinn, Coach Jimmy McGinn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah. He, like I say, he had a lot, a lot of success with, with, with those girls' programs. And um, the, the local high school as well seems to be like a, an absolute feeding ground for basketball players. You know, Mike Burton was the P teacher, and there was a a, a, a female P teacher called uh, Mrs. Lodge, and uh, she was a netball coach or netball enthusiast, however you want to say it. But she also had like a, a you know a real hunger for basketball as well, and and those two together alongside the Panthers at the time, you know, were just developing huge amounts of talent. And you know, I don't know the the exact stats, but I believe that Ellesmere Port Catholic High School is still one of the most successful high schools in uh, school basketball, uh, English school basketball history, the amount yeah. of titles that they won over the years. So, no, it was um, it was good. 
like I say, I played Osmia Port, Panthers, um, up until I was under 16s before then moving to Manchester Magic. So obviously, you know, one of the more respected uh, National League programmes, especially then I was going there and they were winning everything every year and had two very successful years there under 18s. And who was your coach uh, at, the, at the Magic? Was that Joe, Joe Forbes was there or was that um, no. Jeff or... Who, no, so Joe, Joe Forbo was there and overseeing everything, but my coach was Samit. And, okay. Um, Samit, yeah. One of my close, so, good friends. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I still speak to Samit to this day, you know, speak to him on WhatsApp. I mean, I, I normally type a message. He normally speaks one back because I don't think his, uh, his spelling is <laughs> that great anymore since he's left the country. But no, we, me and Samit do, still do speak occasionally as well. Like he gives me some advice and things, which is good. But yeah, I was so lucky at, at that age. You know, I was 15 when I went to Manchester. Um, so lucky to make the team. It was only me and one other... 16, well, I turned 16 in August. So going into that season, there was only me and one other 16-year-old that play, that made the under-18s team. Everyone else was the year above us. Um, you know, and just so lucky at such, an, at, at such a young age to be learning from such a... Um, a detailed coach like Sam it was like I'd never I'd never experienced anything like it like the details offensively details defensively like how to defend certain situations and things like that was just you know it was amazing to be learning from him and you know definitely to this day I still use some of Samit's theories sure, in my sure. coaching as well so yeah. you know, it, it was good and then obviously I went to Gran Canaria a year after that as well to the academy and Samit went that year as well so I was really lucky to have Samit as my coach for three years Wow, yeah. wow and you who know, was, that, who else was at uh, CBA at that time at Gran Canaria? Was Tim Lewis there at of, that time? No, no, no I think he was there the year before or two years before me Right um, so, you know, we had some coaches, like there's a, a coach called uh, Joseph Jelinek, his son plays in the ACP, and uh, David Jelinek, his name is, and, you know, just some really good players that were, you know, who had turned into coaches, and it was good just to get all this information from all these coaches that had played in all these leagues, and, you know, not just that, playing against some really, really, really good players who have gone on to do some really good things as well. So, you know, that was a great experience for me. Right, and then from from the Grand Canaria Academy, what, what happened from there? Um, so after that, I actually went to um, Leeds. Um, they were just uh, Leeds Carnegie at the time, so Matt Newby was coaching. Um, I was originally going to Worcester, and I was going to go and uh, you know go go to university there and probably get involved in the books programs and uh, and whatever, but. When I actually went to visit Worcester, it was just a little bit too familiar for me. It's very much like Chester. Um, you know, it's the, the same sort of style city. And I thought, if I'm going to move away, like I'd like to experience like a different, you know, situation, a different way of life sort of thing. So um, it was actually Samit that helped me get um, a conversation with Matt Newby. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Matt helped, you know, make a transfer happen really, really late on in the year. And, you know, it's when they were playing Division One. So I was playing with the Division One team. I was playing with the Division Three team, just floating in between the two teams. And um, yeah, again, it was it was another good experience. But I didn't I didn't finish my degree. I'd done a year, and you know, just it wasn't for me. I just that year out from studying and being away from education. I think um, you know it just didn't help. It, it was it, I just couldn't get back into. It. I couldn't get into the swings of things, and I didn't want to waste my time being there. But still, you know, being involved with Matt, you know, Summit, these are, you know, Grand Canaria. This this is an incredible, and plus your homegrown situation. I mean, that's a that's a really interesting group of coaches, you know, to take a lot of just a little bit here and a little bit there. That's that's great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like you say, it's just about taking things from each person, do you know what I mean? And, um, you know, there's definitely been a lot of people along the way, like, say, Summit, um, Matt Newby, Mike Burton, um, but I'd say Mike Byrne, I, I took more from him once I became a coach um, because obviously school basketball at that age, you know, up, up until under 16, he retired when I was in year 11. So when I started really taking it seriously and the details and things like that, um, you know, that's when I got it from Matt. But obviously learned so much from from, sure. from Mike as well once I uh, became so a coach. What was the what was your first um, kind of coaching stop and 
or, or were you all of this time, you know, were you, were you seeing these coaches in action and saying, you know, actually, I think I can, I can get involved with that. What, what, what was that process? I think from like, a, you know, I've always been quite mature for my age in terms of like leading and, um, you know, quite outspoken and things like that. Um, I think that's always been noticed as well. You know, I was the captain in my school team and, you know, I'd, I'd organised the team. I remember Mike Burton one time he was saying, Ben, I need you to go and speak to this player because he needs to come to training and all this. So, you know, he was giving me instruction even at, when I was 14, 15, trying to get players into training and, and things. So, you know, captain there, I was the captain of the Manchester Magic under 18's team as well from for Summit. So I, I was always sort of that extension of the coach um, you know, I wasn't the best player ever, you know, you know, no, not going to start making lies and saying I was a superstar or anything like that. But I was quite smart, you know, and that 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 was from early on, like you say. But my first actual um, coaching stop was once I finished in Leeds and I came home and I was getting into the work in life. You know, I was, I was bouncing around a couple of jobs before I started, you know, finding a, a career that I wanted to go down. Um. I still wanted to be involved in basketball, whether that was playing or coaching, but there was just no men's team locally for me to play for. Um, you know, I could have travelled to Liverpool, but it was just meaning, you know, a, a, quite a while to get over there and all that sort of thing. So um, this is when the Cheshire juniors were around. So, the, the you know, the, the, the junior programme for the pro team. So I... Um, I, I went and spoke to Mike Burton, who was the head coach of the the, the whole junior programme. And I said to him, I said, look, I'd love to be getting involved. I feel like I've got a lot to give. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I have played at this level quite recently. I think I was only 21 at the time. So, I, and I wanted to take the under 18s team. I thought, you know, that was the, where I, I'd be best suited, where I'd had experience and, and won at that level. So... Um, you know, we, we, I was lucky enough for, for Mike to give me that opportunity to start coaching under 18 straight away. Right. That's fantastic. And so um, this was just obviously a voluntary situation or um, how many times a week and, 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 and how was it progressing? How did, how did it move along? So, yeah, completely voluntary. Um, we trained twice a week. It was Monday and Wednesday for an hour and a half or two hours. I can't remember the exact times. Um, and then games at weekends but my uncle was coaching one of the junior pro teams at the time so I'd always go to his sessions as well so I'd be doing more than more than two sessions I'd you know I'd go and help out um, with the girls program as well my uncle done a girls team one time so you know I'd always be like around the teams and just trying to give advice and learn and you know just do different drills that I, I, I thought was was good and you know just trying to do as much as possible at that time all all the time as well you know, I'd be with the pro team, the, the the Phoenix at the time, in training. So John Lavery was coaching at that time, and I, I'd done it when John Cafino was here. Um, Colin O'Reilly, I'd, I'd done a couple of his sessions as well. So I was always around training with the pro team and just being one of the training players because obviously the roster's always been quite small here. Right, that's great. And and so were you starting to get something in the back of your mind that hey, this is this is what I wanted to do. Um, maybe not even from that professional standpoint, but you know, maybe you're just saying, you know, I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna start community coaching, and I'm gonna, you know, or was this just, you know, this was just a love, a passion? Yeah, honestly, hand on heart, like I never expected to get any money from basketball. Like when I first started coaching the under 18s, it was just the case of me wanting to give back. Um, you know, I didn't expect anything in exchange for that. I thought that you know there was a lot of coaches that came before me that done it for me as well, that coached for free. And I just wanted to do to, to do that. And, you know, um, like I say, it was, it was John Lavery, the first person that when I was training with him, like he actually asked me, he said, do you want to come to the games? Do you want to come along to the games, sit on the bench, just be an extra set of eyes and ears on the on the bench for me and, you know, just just help me out a little bit. And, I, you know, again, there was there was no financial reward for that. I was just so keen to give back and, and help as much as, as much and in any way that I could. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a that's a that's a common story, and it. What what I'm interested about is the fact that you know this is your hometown club, um, and you've gone through this process not quite you know directly through like you said you've gone you went to Manchester and you went to Gran Canaria, but you know you're still this is your 
this is your area. This is, you know, you have a lot of, you know, passion and feeling for that area. And, and that happens to me where I see this more is obviously in Europe and, and some other parts of the world where there's a more natural kind of uh, path through as a junior player, senior player, and then into coaching. Um, and I think that's so, so missing in our country. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, happy that that's some, you know, kind of some of the process that you've been through. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, so when you were when you were the assistant coach or kind of assistant coach to John now, are you starting to get some thoughts in your mind about how to coach the game? Are you are you giving him some some things that you think you could put in? Um, you know, just talk to me a little bit about, you know, come at some of your early experiences there. Um, just just little things, honestly. It was it was never big things at this point. So I remember quite clearly in my head just one session that I can sort of expand on. So he was putting a, a, a two three zone in. It was quite early in the year, and we were just talking about positioning. And Samit had ran a two three zone with me for the whole three years that I was under him. And the way Samit was always taught us just a little bit about positioning on the weak side. So how you should be looking at the ball body position and that sort of thing and you know I just sort of started getting into that so when John was putting the the, the zone in I would sort of just offer my input and um, things like that but it would never be I'd come to him and say right I think you should start doing this and, and, and doing that it was literally just little points early on sure, sure. Um, you know watching how he you know planned his training sessions what sort of drills we've done um, the big one for me is like watching how each coach that I've been around uh, with the pro team is how they manage the players as well. How they talk to the players was it was a huge thing. Um, you know how they address the whole group, how they in address individuals and things like that. So yeah, that was that was a huge thing for me at that that point. Learning each one of their sort of tendencies and and, and what how they do that. That's great stuff. Really, really good stuff. I mean, um, and like I said, you've, you know, you've got these experiences. So now it's starting to come to this, you know, incredible situation. I mean, um, talk to me about this kind of this time where you did get, you know, put into the position to be a head coach, um, regardless of experience or anything. So that, that must have been a, a daunting and an incredible situation at the same time. Yeah, it was it was a strange one. Obviously, um, the club made a couple of changes in the 2016-2017 season. Uh, they brought in a new head coach, uh, Colin O'Reilly, who had been a player here previously. Very good player, you know, had some had some you know good success. Never really won anything, but you know he was a, he was a good player, and, and we expected a lot from him as a club. Um, when he came in, you know, he, you know, he, he done things very differently. He had the players wearing heart monitors, you know, he was making sure they were working hard all the time and things like that, which was something that I'd, I'd never seen before. And that was something that he provided. He had it on his iPad, you know, and he'd have the players wearing a little vest every training session. But the one thing about him is that he said when he came in that he didn't really want an assistant coach who wasn't going to be there full time. And obviously the club never had the money to sort of put someone there full time. So I completely get where he's coming from because to have an assistant coach and to trust them, you do have to have them there day in, day out with the players so that the players trust them as well. Um, obviously his time here wasn't very successful and the club ended up making some changes just before Christmas. Um, so obviously they brought a new coach in uh, who was Robbie Pierce, who had had a lot of success here in like the early 2000s. Um, don't don't, and... don't don't I know? Uh, <laughs> stop yeah. me winning three trophies, that's for sure. <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, he had, he had a lot of success here, and you know, we just hoped that he was going to be sort of a turning point in the team because you know the the community programs were getting so much better off the court, was getting so much better within the club, and you know we just needed that success on the court. Um, but there was a there was a, there was a two or three week gap from when Colin left and Robbie could start because he had a lot of business down in London like he you know he, he ran a couple of different businesses and coaching in schools and things like that um so in those in those two or three weeks we had two games we had one against Sheffield in Sheffield and we had one in Glasgow in Glasgow and the Sheffield game Sheffield game was actually coached by James Bryce and I assisted him James Bryce is our general manager who also coaches with um our junior program um so James took over that one and then the game on in Glasgow, I think it was on 
just after Christmas, like maybe even Boxing Night or something like that. It was, it was very, it was in between Christmas and New Year, I think. And James was with the junior team in a trip to um, Germany. So Mike had to coach that one. And Mike asked me if I wanted to go and be an assistant coach because he hadn't been around the team that much and I'd been training with them. So I knew the plays and I could help him. Um, and that's what happened. So Mike took over the game, you know, it was crazy. I, I think we won on the buzzer in the end. And, you know, it was on BBC. Glasgow had filled their 6,000 seat arena, you know, the, the the running hall, the athletics hall. Yeah. And we weren't expected to win. We went there, you know, and and we won. And, you know, after the game, Bert turned around to me and said, Ben, honestly, you, you really, really impressed me there. Like you said, some really good things. And I was only telling him what I thought but he acted on it. So, you know, as a head coach, you do listen to your assistants and sometimes you ignore what they say. Sometimes you take on board what they say. And um, luckily for me, he took on board what I said and it worked. So, you know, he was really impressed then. And when Robbie Pierce came in, I think um, Mike had spoken to Robbie about having me on board and just being there and helping him. And, and that's how it happened. So, um, then I was reinstated as like a proper assistant coach now, like I had the title and everything and, you know, the, the proper t-shirt and, you know, it was good. Look, again, learning from Robbie, the way he spoke to them. I think that's the biggest thing that I took from Robbie is, you know, how he spoke to the players. Like he was always like, you will make this shot. He was always very positive with them. Super positive. Um, you know, it was, it was just like some of the terminology that you, you heard him say was, was really, really good. And, you know, we'd never be like, if we missed this shot, we'd always be like, you're going to make this shot on this play. And it was just, it was really good. Um, but then just, obviously Robbie had to, sorry, go on. Just, 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 just I just want to just put just one little, uh, uh, just splice in here and just say um, uh, that this story that you've just talked about will get verified by Mike Burton next week when we run that yeah. podcast because Mike's actually told me that story almost verbatim to what you've talked. And so yeah. I'm really, really excited about that and uh, happy because that's exactly how he, he described that situation. So yeah, that's no, great. it's that's good. Great stuff. We, we, we do talk about it quite often. Like, you know, it, it is crazy how I got the opportunity and it's literally just from me giving Mike some advice in that game and he, he did listen to it and, you know, I could have gave him the same advice and it might not have worked and we might not be here right now, but, <laughs> uh, but it you, did work. And it's, it's, it's luck. luck sometimes. You need so, a yeah. Luck. Then, yeah. so you went yeah. then, then the Robbie situation. Yeah. Some things happened there and yeah. So, so Robbie unfortunately had to leave um, just some personal matters off the court. You know, we had to go and take care of some things back down in London and things like that. This business had to come first and his personal life had to come first. So, um, we're now March the 2nd. I still remember it to the day. I was in work. I was working on a building site. And um, Mike Burton rings me, goes, Ben, um, we were playing Leicester. Honestly, this is a Thursday night. And we were playing Leicester the next day. And Bert rings me, goes, Ben, Robbie can't make the game tomorrow. Um, I will coach if you want me to. But what I really want to happen is I want you to step up and be the head coach. What do you think? And... Um, I think I took probably five seconds just to, you know, take it in. I said, yeah, I'll do it. I said, I'll do it. So I took over for that weekend. I think we played Leicester in a back-to-back -back game. I can't remember what it was. It might have been like the semi-final in the trophy or second leg of the trophy or something like that. Um, lost both games. But um, after the weekend, the news obviously then trickled down that Robbie was going to be unavailable for the rest of the season. And Mike said, listen, I want you to take over for the rest of the year. Um, you know, I believe in you. I think you can do a great job. So I spoke to work about letting me go part-time for the rest of the season and then I'd go full-time again after April or May. They let me do that. And yeah, I just took, took the rest of the season. And in, in, in those 11 games that I took over, I'd won more games than Robbie and Colin in the, that whole season. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so uh, you obviously knew the players. Um, did you change much there, like tactically? Or was it just pure motivation you know what what do you think was the key to you winning games versus you know say Robbie and, and Colin that season I think there's obviously aspects of luck involved like you know I, I can't take full credit for it but one of the things is that um, we made a change that year as well at the point guard position um, we brought a guard called Mike Dunno back that was there a couple of seasons ago with John Cofino 
and I was a training player when Cofino was the coach. Um, and I'd seen how good Mike Danuno was. He left, he, he injured his back that year. But then when he came back, you know, I spoke to Mike and um, just got the best out of him, really. And he, he absolutely had an unbelievable uh, 11 games un, under me. And, you know, we just, I sort of gave him that little bit of freedom that a player like that needs sometimes to, to go and do well and express himself on the court. And along with other players like Earl Brown Jr., who went up to Glasgow and... Um, Jamel Anderson was there. Raheem May Thompson was there. You know, we had some we had some really good talent. Dijon, um, Alan Jordan, who came back here a year later after a, a break from from playing, and we just played with a lot of freedom. Um, you know, transition basketball, very sort of simple offenses with a quick first phase, then getting into a pick and roll situation because we had such a good ball handler that, you know, I just wanted to have a quick phase of offence, move the defence a little bit and then get into them sort of situations where we could make it count. And, you know, we did and, you know, we had some success doing that. That's great. And so from there, um, that summer, you know, obviously uh, the club, you know, show the faith in you and, and, and say, you know, we want you to be our new head coach. Um, firstly, how did that make you feel? And then secondly, you know, what did that then mean to you? And, and how did you go about um, being a full time BBL head coach? OK, so this is a little bit of a strange one as well. So, um Obviously, I'd had 11 games experience as a, as a professional coach. Uh, I wasn't getting paid at that point. I was literally just doing it as a volunteer, working part-time. Um, and Bert just said to me, you know, I met with Bert in the summer. He said, you know, do you want to do it? As Along with the other directors of the club. I said, yeah, I do want to do it. And he said, well, look, we are taking a little bit of a gamble. Like, you know, we can't, you know, we can't really offer you much it's either we put the money into a coach or we put the money into the team, into the playing budget, which at that point was pretty small anyway. So I took a whole year working part-time. I worked wow. 27 and a half hours a week and didn't get paid for my first full season as a coach. Just done right. it. Um, I complete, um, you know, I, I had a company that I worked for before coaching and he was just very understandable. He fit my, he fit my hours around training. So Mondays, I'd work full time because we were always off on a Monday. Tuesday, I'd start 15 minutes later to go get a morning session in with the, the players, and then I'd leave at three o'clock for training in the afternoon. And, you know, my boss just fitted my days around my practice really, really good. Right. Um, and yeah, just so lucky to have that, that, op that opportunity at such a young age because, you know, I'm 25, 26 at this point. And, you know, I just sort of thought to myself, if I, if I say no to this opportunity and I let them take another coach on, will I ever get another opportunity to be the head coach ever again of a team? And I just thought that it was that was an opportunity that I couldn't say no to. That's a great soundbite, coach, you know, and um, I'm actually going to pull that out there because really important for young coaches to, to hear that. I will say that even from, from my perspective, um, I made a, a classic mistake um, when I was uh, after Birmingham Bullets where I was offered um, the uh, Antwerp job in Belgium and I didn't think I was fully ready for it and I turned it down instead of taking it and just running with it and, uh, and, and making the best of that situation. So definite um, regret in my, in my coaching career. So I'm full of uh, admiration that you, you did that and you said, look, I'm going to take this and I'm going to run with it. Um, so just talk to me about um, how you went into that season. You know, you're, you're by far the youngest coach in the BBL at that stage, uh, younger than, well, not all of your players, but some of the players. Um, what were you, first of all, you know, how did you approach that? And then secondly, what about your, your philosophy? You know, did you start to, you know, do some things that you really were passionate about defensively, offensively? What were you, what were you looking to do there? So I'll just start with obviously like the, the, the point of like actually going into the summer, um, I think that I, I was fully aware that I wasn't going to be the oldest coach with the most experience. So I wanted to make sure that we had some experience in the team. Um, and, you know, the Jets of old, like you, you played against guys that 
they recruited from within the league. So like James Hamilton's and things like that done well elsewhere. Then came to the Jets and had, you know, a lot of success as well. So that's that's sort of what the approach that I took straight away is that I want to get guys who are experienced within the league, know how it works so that, you know, we're not bringing eight new rookies into a team with a rookie coach that, you know, we are going to have that lack of experience. So, um, you know, our two Americans that we recruited that year from within the BBL were Malcolm Riley, who had played at Sheffield, and we recruited a guy called Robert Sandoval, who played at Leeds, brought Raheem May Thompson back, who was, who'd been with us for a year at that point. We brought Orlan Jackman in um, from Newcastle, who at that point had had some success with with the Eagles. And, you know, we, we, we saw that as, you know, good experience. And then, um, you know, brought a couple of rookies and then around around them. And, you know, we just had, you know, a, a pretty good season. Obviously got the BBL Cup win, which was, was amazing, but missed out on the playoffs, which really hurt as well. So, um, yeah. But that, that was the way I approached it anyway. So I've just gone off on a little bit of a tangent. No, there. no, 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 um, no, no. I mean, you did, did an incredible job. Obviously, I was there at Glasgow yeah. at the start. Matter of fact, I think you beat us in the cup. Um, am I not mistaken in saying that? You beat yeah, me in the I cup. Think so. well, I, I, certainly, I think so. certainly, I was one and one. You know, we, we won yeah. one uh, real close and then you beat us on yeah. that crazy i don't even know if it was overtime or it was certainly in the last seconds anyway um, yeah I th- well i think i think was it nate Britt that got the layup and uh all and jackman took it off the ring once yes. it was gone or something like yeah. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah no we we had some great success obviously we took it took a big gamble on cj gettys that year as well um you Incredible. know bringing a traditional big back into the league that you know the, the bbl hadn't seen a traditional big like that for a long time and you know me being old school in terms of the way of thinking and how the Jets were back in the day, they'd always had a real good big guy, whether that was, you know, Billy Singleton, Lauren Meyer, Piero Cameron, you know, there was always some real big guy underneath the basket being able to, you know, do a lot of damage inside on both ends of the floor. So, you know, yeah, we, we had some great, great talent. And, you know, when I first started coaching, you know, one of my goals myself was I wanted to be every other coach. You know, and that was like my target. You know, I didn't really say I want to finish top of the league. I just I, as a coach, I just wanted to make sure that I was good enough to to be at this level. And you know, luckily, I have beat every coach in the league. I think it took me That's... a year to beat, uh, it took me a year to beat Rob Panostro. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, listen, that, that that's great stuff because uh, that reminds me a little bit about myself. You know, when I went to Newcastle. Um, I was the youngest coach in the league by, by, by a long way. I was 29 years old um, or 30 years old at that stage when Paul took me. And I was, a, you know, I had, I'd had a lot of experience in other places, but not, you know, I, I really, um, you know, he took a gamble on me because at that time, you know, there were, well, we know the world-class coaches that were in that league at that time. Yeah, and, yeah. You're, and you're absolutely right. You know, I was like saying to myself, you know, um, I want to beat Chris Finch. I want to beat Nick Nurse. I want to beat Billy Mims. Yeah. And I was going up against those guys. That's a great, you know, that's, you have to have a competitive element in there. And uh, that's fantastic. So how are you setting the team up that year? Um, you know, from a tactical perspective, what, what, what are you looking to do? You know, you've got CJ, you know, like you say, as an inside player, are you kind of four out, one in? What, what, what was your philosophy there and, and how were you looking to play? Yeah, so um, that year, obviously, our starting five was Malcolm Riley, Rob Sandoval, uh, Orlan Jackman, Raheem Thompson, CJ Gaze inside. So Orlan and uh, Raheem are both, you know, hybrid forwards, three, four, four, three type players. Um, so those guys were sort of interchangeable, but we'd also ha- always have CJ inside when he was on the floor. Um, so, yeah, I was always keen on shooting. You know, I, when I was a player, you know, that's the position I played shooting guard. So, you know, we'd always set up to have, um, you know, a lot of shooters. Raheem had a great season that year. I think he averaged over 40%. Malcolm Riley and Robert Sandoval were high 30s from three-point line. So we just had a great inner, inner, inside-outside game. Ball goes into CJ, defence collapses, and then we'd always have some sort of action on the weak side to get somebody free. Um, so, yeah, that was how I'd sort of set up the offences, you know, just to make sure that the ball had the opportunity to go in and to come out at the same time because we had such a big guy around the basket who, you know... He has unbelievable hands, CJ. Like, you know, around the basket, in terms of a scorer, you know, I don't think the league's seen a big guy like that for a very, very long time. And I don't know if we will in the near future. Yeah. And and obviously he was 
like super heavy at that stage as well and that was yeah. that was probably as a surprise in you know not just high touch you know skill but it was so heavy it was almost like when he posted deep you know it was it was over you know it was really yeah. over and and yeah. and I, and i used to say to a number of coaches around the league listen he might not look in shape but he is yeah. in shape somehow some yeah. way it, it, it's that fake fake kind of uh you know like as, as other you know fans and coaches are just laughing because they're saying he's overweight yeah. but he was he was a warrior then he really yeah was. It, it, in that sense he was very much like billy singleton like back in the day like you'd, you'd look at billy and say how is this guy going to play 30 40 minutes a game but yeah, he done it night in, night out and was one of the most effective forwards in the league because he knew how to use his body. And at that point, CJ knew how to use his body as well. You know, he, he'd get position and, you know, there was no moving him around. He Like say, he was heavy, you know, I think he was like 280, 290 pounds at that time. And, you know, when he's that close to the basket, he was more or less unstoppable. And unless the defence really helped him, then we'd be wide open on the perimeter. So, yeah, it was, um, it was an interesting year. It was good, you know, learned a lot. And so, um, you know, you, you come to play the, the, the BBL Cup, uh, you're in the semifinals, um, you lose the first leg, by, you know, by 13 points. Um, what are you telling your team and what are you, what are you saying? Um, that's, a, that's a really tough amount of points to overcome. And, uh, you know, what, was the, what, was, what, would, what did you say straight after the game? What were you saying leading up to the second game? And how did you pull off this, this, this incredible win? Well, it, it was it was funny, like that whole that whole series getting to that final was crazy because go back again to the quarterfinals. We were playing Newcastle Eagles and um in Newcastle and we were down three. We were down three with I wanna say ten seconds to go. I mean, you could probably get the clip up somewhere. I, I got the clip. I got the clip <laughs> in my mind. I remember it like yeah. like crystal clear because it was yeah. almost impossible to for Newcastle was, to lose that game. And, yeah, uh, it was it know, was crazy. Because, Fab, Fab, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Fab only has to throw it in the corner and the game's over. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. We went we went to the line for two shots, and CJ came up to me and said to me I, just before he was going to shoot, he was the one that was shooting. He goes, Ben, should I miss the the second shot on purpose because if, I'd, if he'd scored, they'd have advanced the ball and we'd have had no chance to win. And I said to him, yeah, tell Raheem and Orland to go in for the rebounds. And if you've got to miss the second shot, miss the second shot. We'll go for the offensive rebound and, and tip it back out. No word of a lie. CJ Getty shot that second free throw with his eyes closed and he made it. I couldn't believe it. You know, he, he ran down the court saying I had my eyes closed and everything. Fab calls a timeout. In, in, advanced the ball. And I said to them, okay, we've got one chance here and it's to stop the ball coming in. That's the only way we're going to get another chance at this game. So I put Orlan on the... Because Orlan had a, has a great wingspan. I put him on the inbound pass. I put CJ on help side so they couldn't do any lobs over the top. I had Raheem Mark in the corner and I had Rob Sandoval taking anyone that came out the top of the key. And the first pass was... Um, Fab passed it to his right to Defoe and Raheem got there late into the passing lane and hit it back out of bounds so hardly any time got taken off the clock and they advanced the ball a little bit further at this point now it was hard to pass to the corner because it was getting a little bit closer and the gap was a little bit smaller and I remember it's the day he bounced past it I'm sure to the top and Rob Sandoval was so quick got his hand to it uh, took a couple of dribbles. All and ran down the court, and we got a layup and won on the buzzer. It was, it was crazy. Unbelievable. Yeah, it, it was crazy. And then obviously, then going on to lose the first leg of the semi-finals was obviously disappointing against London. They had a great team that year. They had some really good players. And um, like you say, after, after the game, like we, I was really positive. Like no one else, and, and I, I'm honestly sure that if you asked anyone around the club, they'd have said they didn't see how we'd win it. But I just, I don't know, I just had a really good feeling. You know, when you just, as a coach, you have those times where you, you feel really good about something. And, you know, I, I was positive that we were going to get something from the game. So I, I said to the players, I said, this score can level up within one quarter. If we have two or three good runs within a quarter, we can be going in to the second quarter, four points down. And you wouldn't believe it, but in the first four minutes, we'd leveled the game up going in. And it was just a case of then for the, for the 35, 36 minutes that was left, just to manage the game and we just had an unbelievable game a lot of luck you know London missed some wide open three pointers and things like that but 
you know, we we just put them on the back foot from the very start, and you know, just managed to see the game out and unbelievable. I, you know, I, I still I, Dan Routledge tweeted this. I'm sure no team had ever turned around such a deficit away from home in the second leg before, no. and I, I think that's still the biggest to the day. So yeah, yeah I, I, I I I only I overturned Newcastle by nine. I think it was yeah. in Newcastle, but um, never never that. I mean, it's a psychologically, it's a that's a tough tough uh, figure. It's an incredible incredible win coach. Um, yeah. So now you go to the final. What are you starting to believe? Are you starting to believe you're the team of destiny? Is that something you was that a rallying call, or you know, did you kind of temper that? How did you how did you feel about that? Again, I honestly believe if you asked everyone in the club, they would have said after the event. Obviously, before the club, they were always positive, and you know, they were saying the right things to me, the directors, James, the general manager, and the players. You know, I only think the people that believed that we could win was me and the the, the eight or nine guys that we had, and. I just didn't, I couldn't see how Worcester were going to beat us. I honestly, I, you might call me stupid. Mike, I had the blinkers on. I just did not know how they were going to beat us that game. Um, I thought, you know, player for player, we, we sort of had them matched up pretty well. You know, they had Bichinski, a big seven footer. We had Gettys. They had two long wing players, Palmer and uh, Parrish. We had Raheem and Orlan. I just didn't see it. I, I could not see how they were going to beat us. And you know the club done some really really good things. Um, James, the general manager, had this this video message set up. So the night before we we went down to Birmingham, and we went for a team meal. And when we got back to the hotel, James had emailed and spoken to all the players, families, girlfriends, parents back home, awesome. and actually had had a message put up uh, on. And we we've shown this video in one of the meeting rooms at the hotel the night before the game. You know, we we just sort of said like, you know, they 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 aren't they can't be here in person, but they have got a message, and we played that in front of everyone. And I think, you know, we just we were all just so together for that game and ready nice. to go. The atmosphere was really good, and like I said, I just didn't see how we were going to lose. I mean, the, the, I, I I watched the game back this summer actually during lockdown, and it was the worst start to any game. I think we were sixteen five down within the first quarter, and we still ended up winning by twelve points. I think it was so. Yeah. yeah, some things are just meant to be, and I just couldn't see us losing that one. No, oh, that's awesome. That's a, that's an incredible. So now you're, you know, you go into these like second and third seasons. You know, are you talk talk to me about how, what what a typical week is minus COVID. Talk talk to me about you know your your your, your normal kind of coaching week um, and how you're preparing for a game. Um, I think you normally play Sundays. Am I right in saying? Yeah. You're normally a Sunday yeah. home game. So talk yeah. talk to me about how that how that would be. Mondays off and then. Yeah. Yeah. So mon- Mondays off. Um. All you know. This year is obviously very difficult. I think every team will have, you know, difference in schedules from from the last few years. So, last year, Mondays were off. Tuesday morning was SNC. We had a great facility last year, just outside of Chester, um, two really good strength and condition coaches. So we'd go there as a whole team on the Tuesday morning, uh, do an hour, hour and thirty minutes with with the coaches, and then um, Tuesday afternoon we'd train. Um, sometimes we'd watch film on a Tuesday, but most of the time we'd w- watch film on a Wednesday, um, just because just because of the way we had um, our venue set up at the time, we we train at our arena on a Tuesday, and that that session to me was all about us not focusing on the opposition, not focusing on some of the mistakes that we made. It was always just about us. Can we get a good scrimmage together? Can we start this, the week off well? And you know. Uh, high spirits, good work ethic, that sort of thing. So Tuesday was sort of our day to have like a, a, a real scrimmage, just us against us, not really putting too much detail into the other team at that point. Um, Wednesday then we'd watch film before training and then we'd scrimmage again on Wednesday, but we'd be start putting like, um, you know, a scout team in. So we'd have one five running their plays and one five, you know, defending how, we, you know, how we're going to defend certain actions and things like that. And then, depending on the schedule, if we had a game on the Friday, we wouldn't scrimmage on the Thursday. It'd just be something like shooting, walkthroughs, that sort of thing. If we had a game on Saturday or Sunday, sometimes we'd scrimmage on a Thursday. But again, our club's always had a small roster, so we've got to 
balance, sure. scrimmaging, Absolutely. risk injury, you know, pushing the guys a little bit too much. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday would normally start be winding down individual workouts, some team shooting drills and, you know, walkthroughs going through the plays, but not really going five and five. Just like I say, I think in an ideal world, we would play five and five more, but we just don't have the personnel, the numbers to be doing that day in, day out and knowing that we're going to have guys fresh for the weekend. So, yeah, that's that's a, a normal week for us. And are you, um, your typical, like, practice structure, are you, you're quite, you, you want to try to get into these kind of game-like situations in a five-on-five five situation, or are you breaking stuff down in, in drills, or um, what, what's your kind of philosophy with regards to that? Um, certain things take drills so like pick and roll defense would always start off as a drill so just um, the guard and the big man how we're going to defend it then we'd start adding maybe go to four and four there to five and five where we're going to help from in those situations depending if we're hard hedging whether we're just flattening the flattening the pick and staying in the lane or icing um, so we'd, we'd build certain things up like that I, I've got you know a, a drill that I do like a three on three close out drill where the defense is at a disadvantage nice Um you know, just, just to make sure that we're closing out the way we want to close out every single time. And, you know, when you're playing three on three like that, it's tough because, you know, there's always an advantage for the offense and it's easy to get some scores sometimes, but it's about making the defense work. So, yeah, it's different. Sometimes we do drills and sometimes we play. Um, I don't think there's a substitute for playing sometimes, though, and, you know, getting up and down and getting that competitive edge going as well. How do you think from those first you know those last games of that first season to now you know you going into what's you know kind of your fourth season how do you think your philosophy has changed and how are you changing it are you are you changing you know your mindset oh I'm going to start defending this way or I've got this idea to attack you know from an offensive standpoint or are you still you know got a core for a set of principles that you think hey I'm going to stick to this I definitely have a core set of principles that I've used all, all along in terms of defence, where we want to help from, where we want to force guys, that sort of thing, how we want to defend pick and rolls, um, you know, making sure that we're a help help defence. And it, it hurts us sometimes. You know, we help a little bit too much sometimes and, you know, give guys shots on the perimeter. But I've always been under the impression that if we're going to get beat, let's get beat. The other team's taking contested threes rather than get beat inside. So, you know... Well, is it, there are in, in, in the BBL, that's a good philosophy. <laughs> Trust me, you know, yeah. protect the paint is a, yeah. is a is a great because we don't have that many great shooters in the BBL. That's probably one yeah. of the biggest weaknesses. But yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah, sorry. So, sorry. like I say, so, some some of the things some of the things remain the same. Um, in terms of like the way I approach things now, it's a little bit different over the last couple of years. I, I'm you know I'm getting used to watching film a lot more, and um, I think that as the years go on, like I am getting better at doing film, um, you know, making sure that it's engaging at the same time as um, informative because, you know, I, when I first started, you know, I'd, I had no idea. I hadn't really been an assistant coach and been like a video editor or worked around guys. So literally we'd sit there in the, in the, in the um, film room and literally just watch the game, like start to finish sometimes. And I'd be talking through it and, you know, the players just aren't taking it. And after the first five minutes of watching the game and you're stopping it and starting it, it's it's not engaging. So, you know, I've started using Synergy a lot more, which is a great tool, um, you know, and just, you know, trying to show good things and bad things and approach the games and approach the oppositions a little bit more organised. I think that's one thing that I am getting better at is like my organisation before a game, getting the guys prepared because that it's so tough now to, to sort yeah. of get an edge on the opposition. Definitely. I mean, now there's so much video, it's almost impossible to, to not know what the, other, the opposing team's doing or tendencies. And obviously you can now see so much, you know, once upon a time we were watching one game a week from the week before and you never know, that might have just been a bad week or they may have only ran a set for like three times. Now you can see six games behind, you know, and you've got a tent, you can really know, hey, I'm with, they're definitely going to run this stuff, you know, in, in this game so uh yeah, yeah you know like you say i mean that's that's normally how i'd approach it as well i'd watch synergy i'd, I'd get half overall half court offense from a team let's say the leicester riders and i'd on a pen and paper i'm, I'm quite old school like you know i make a lot of notes on just a pad 
and I'd have their offences drawn out and I'd tally up which offence they're using the most because we, we can't learn all five, no. six, seven, eight offences of a team. So over these last few games, which offence are they using the most and what offence are they scoring from? And normally I try and focus it to two or three offences and that's what we'd, we'd, we'd try and focus on and just, you know, it, it's so difficult. We, we live in a, you know, a, a time now where, you know, it's, it's just so hard to get an advantage and, you know, I do have my a few little tricks up my sleeve when you're playing against teams that are really well prepared as well. Obviously, you might not say them on here. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. Great stuff, Coach. Um, two quick questions, uh, and then we're going to move on to some different subjects. First, um, what's your approach then to recruiting? Um, you've done a great job. You've brought in some really, really high-level players. Um, you know, what, what? what's your philosophy on on that you uh, you know obviously I had Rob Pat on a couple of weeks ago and you, you heard what he said there and so so w- what are you looking for in a player are you looking for his talent are you looking for character what, what what types of things are you looking for when you recruit a player okay so this is from Mike Burton and um, obviously Mike's been around a long time and you know he he says to me all the time the numbers don't lie like you've got to find guys that get it done consistently, whether that's through a year at college, two years at college, four years at college, whatever it is, years at, years pro. Like their stats have to be good, and I think that's where I sort of base it first on. Like you know, you get sent all these profiles, and I'll have a look at the stats. And if the stats are interesting, depending on how many minutes they play, I always look at how many minutes they play as well. If they play. 36 minutes and they average 12 points. Well, that's not as impressive as somebody who's playing 18 minutes and scoring eight points as well. So, you know, we look at all the stats and then the conferences, where they've, where they've played, the competition that they've played against. Um, and if if those two things add up, then I'll take it to the next step. I'll talk, you know, start looking at video, um, get them on synergy, Look at the good points. Look at the bad points. If that's interesting, then then it's time to start speaking to their coaches. You know, normally get you know on the phone with coaches and ask them you know some some questions. I think I think it was Rob actually that mentioned this. One of my questions that I ask every coach is how durable is the player. Mm. And every time I ask the coach that question, you know that's when you start finding out if the player misses training whether they, you know, they, they train through little injuries and, you know, if, if they're not feeling 100%, do they have to sit out? Because we just can't have guys like that. We need, you know, people that are ready to go, not in go to war for, you know, yeah. we need people that are going to be ready to go to war for you. And, you know, there's certain questions that we ask and we want to hear certain things. So, yeah, that, that's how it goes. For me, it's stats first, um, you know, make sure that they are proven that they can play because, like I say, numbers don't lie where they've played, who they've played against, what sort of level competition it is, then start watching video and then obviously get the references about the, the personality and, you know, the character and things like that. And are you recruiting, um, how are you recruiting uh, your teams at this moment? Are you, you know, like you're looking for a traditional point guard, a big, and then, you know, like limp on the wings or, you know, you know, you want a shooter, you want a hybrid player, you know, forward, what, 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 yeah. just real quickly, what, what are you looking for there? I think it's changed. Like over the four years, my recruitment has changed. Definitely. The first year we had a true point guard and a true big filled it with, like I say, you know, Raheem, May Thompson, Orlan Jackman, Malcolm Riley, who were all sort of hybrid players interchangeable. Malcolm could, was only six foot five, but could play the four if he had to, um, you know, so that was my first year. The second year was a little bit different. We went for a combo guard and then, um, you know, really athletic forwards and wings. Uh, a couple of things happened and we, we ended up bringing CJ back and, you know, that was good for us again. So going into my third year, after having a combo guard for one year and having a true point guard for one year, I had made my mind up that you need a true point guard. Um, you know, somebody who can run the team, that extension of the coach, organise the team. And, you know, that's what we had last year with Parker. And, you know, we've, we've, we've got another great point guard this year with a guy called Karan Ross. He's... You know, he's, he's doing a really good job for us in training and in a couple of games so far. I mean, he had a tough time against Leicester, but he had a great game against Bristol. Um, so, yeah, definitely true point guard for me. I like to have, you know, a big body, but one of the sort of things that I learned having CJ here is that, um, you know, you need to be athletic in this league as well at that, that position. And I think 
however good CJ was offensively for us, like, you know, the way we were playing defence might not have suited him and his defensive sort of style didn't suit us. So the last couple of years, I've had, a, you know, more athletic forwards and, you know, that's probably going to suit me a little bit better moving forward as well. So, yeah, true point guard, but then I'm more or less open to, to the other positions um, being a little bit more, like you say, hybrid and interchangeable. Okay, one quick question. Um, you talked about um, being an inexperienced assistant coach and someone that didn't have a huge amount, especially of experience at the professional level. What are you doing now about uh, assistant coaches and, you know, what's what's your thought process with regards to that? So, again, obviously, um, you know, we're a club that doesn't have the budget and the facilities to offer a full-time assistant coach. So for my first two years, obviously Mike was heavily involved. Mike Burton was heavily involved and that was great to lean on, especially in those early years. Um, you know, if I'd had a bad day, a bad training session or things weren't going well, you know, whilst the players were shooting, he'd be telling me, you know, this happens, this happens to everyone. You know, you've just got to ride these times out sometimes and, you know, uh, bus journeys when we're going to games or away from games and he's given me all this advice um, you know he's got some great stories that I'm sure we'll probably hear on his or we would have heard on his podcast by the time mine comes out um, that was that was great that was invaluable um, and then the last couple of years um, you know lucky enough to have some really close friends in basketball who, who live around the area and last couple of years we've had a guy called Richard McNutt who was a local player again from Asmi Port played for Mike Burton in school went out to college in America and then you know bounced around a couple of leagues in Europe played a short spell at Sheffield as well and um, he was great to have around the team you know that that sort of bridge between coaches and players um, definitely was able to bridge that gap um, I had my uncle involved last year as well that was great you know just to an, an, an older head sometimes give me a little bit of advice in the year when when games aren't going well, games are going well. And this year, actually, um, changes have happened again. So I've got a, an old teammate from Manchester, a guy called Josh Horton, who, same age as me, wants to get involved in basketball and, you know, real high IQ player, and he's going to help me this year. So, yeah, we rely on people giving up a lot of the time, but, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for those guys to be involved as well. But, yeah, that's how the assistant coaches have happened here. Right. Um... Changing completely tack now. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, like I said, you've you've been exposed to some really, really high level, you know, coaches, you know, legends of our game. Um, so you've got great ground in there. But talk to me about, you know, the coaching, the British coaching fraternity, you know, how you see coaching in this country, um, you know, maybe thoughts on, you know, what, what you think should be done or hasn't been done or um, what has helped you, you know, just talk to me a little bit about the, the, the British basketball coaching. Yeah. I mean, again, I think that I'm quite unique in the way that I got to the position I am. You know, a lot of guys, a lot of coaches at high level um, have coached in academies under other head coaches and, you know, been to all these coaching camps and clinics and things like that and shared shared advice. Um, you know, listening to all the, all the conversations that you've had, like, you know, people lean on different coaches in different areas. And I've got a theory, and it might be completely wrong, but people like yourselves and, you know, I was listening to the, the episode that you done with Mark Dunning a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, when you guys were coming up and being coaches and learning the game, there was no internet, there was no synergy, there was no YouTube videos of coaches just sharing it and, you know, the access wasn't there for you guys. So if you wanted to go and learn how a coach done something or learn new plays, new drills, like you had to go and see them. Whereas now, like, we live in a world where it's a little bit more unsociable. Like we can get all that at the touch of a button. And I feel like I don't like it. I, I would prefer it to be the old way. And like, I, you know, I love the stories that Bert tells me about him working with all these coaches that he's worked with. And, you know, I, I'd love to be in that position and learning from people in person. But the truth that the, the truth is that we have it easy. Like we don't need to rely on those and having those friendships 
to get the information out of people. You know, I could be friends with you and say, Tony, I need you to send me a few drills, or I need to, you, I know you, I need you to show me this offense that you run against the zone. Well, I just go in synergy and look at the offense that you play. You yeah. know, it, it's crazy because, you know, we are taking that personal factor out of it, but it's just, that's, it's a very strange times that we live in. That's a, that's such a great observation. Um, so well articulated as well something that um i think that maybe some of the older coaches feel but you know we've never really articulated exactly like you have there um a classic example to me of that is um like what you just described there about um going and seeing people you know uh, in practice or in games I explain, I say this to younger coaches when they're talking about scouting and uh, scouting on video. Um, listen, don't watch Synergy, you know, first. Watch yeah. a game first, a whole game, because there's no context for that play. You, When yeah. you see the play, it's the, the point guard already has the ball in his hands or he's making yeah. the, the initial pass. There's no context to how that came about. Um, you don't know whether that's in the flow. You don't know whether that's come out of a timeout. So I, I, I you know, I, I, and back then, you know, we were, we had to do a lot more, like you say, actually on going there, writing our notes uh, of games. That's a really interesting yeah. observation. Yeah. F f funny enough. I think you actually made a comment to me once. I think you were coaching at Worcester. Um, you know, and Worcester's only two and a half hours away from us and they play on a Friday night. So we'd train at, Friday, you know, an afternoon, 12 or one o'clock on a Friday. And I would go to games and I, I don't think there's any substitute for it, like you're saying. You know, I, I'd see Rob, Robert Lester, I'd go down there every Absolutely. Friday or Saturday night. If, if I wasn't, if I wasn't coaching, if I didn't have a game, I didn't see why I shouldn't be at another game learning about a team. If I don't play them for a couple of weeks, I get to know why he's calling a timeout and I try and sit, you know, this might be a little bit naughty. I try and sit as close to the, the bench as possible. Oh, absolutely. You know, see, see how teams are reacting, seeing, you know, why they're doing certain things at certain times. I've done it to Robert Lester once, actually. Well, they were playing Worcester and I, <laughs> um, Worcester had sold out and they had like the pull-out chairs right be I was front row right behind Rob's bet timeout. So I was just trying to listen as much as I possibly could, but... No, I, I agree completely. You get to see a lot more in person watching full games, how the bench acts when the camera's down on the other end of the floor and all that Absolutely. sort of stuff. Like massively important. And just two quick stories on that. The first is if you've listened, if anyone listens to the uh, the, the excellent Mark Woods um, MVP cast uh, with Nick Nurse, Nick tells that exact same story that he used to drive to um, London Towers to 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 watch um, Kevin yeah. Cadle coach. Um, and you know, I myself was was going to see Chris Finch and um, Nick at Manchester. I would do that every single week. And more importantly. Um, when I was at Everton, I'd be one of the one of the uh, almost always in the in the bleachers at Northgate Arena when Chester were playing, and I wasn't uh, at Everton. Yeah, yeah. So um, you just get a really good feel for a team and uh, the way that the coach is coaching in certain areas. So that's great. Um, do you do you have any you know kind of um, coaches that you you gravitate to? Not not like coach Mike Burton and and some of the people that are within your own sphere but you know do you exchange ideas with any other of the coaches in the BBL or what 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 do you feel about that situation about the fraternity as a, as a whole um uh, there's only one coach that I probably speak to more than others um you know when when you go to arenas and you, you know you get a 5 minute 10 minute chat with the coaches and you know we all share that sort of you know, that, that, that little bit of time with each other and talk. But there's one coach there, Manchester Giants, Danny Byrne. Um, me and him sort of came into the league at the same time. So we sort of have that in common, um, you know, only 40 minutes apart. So we do, we, we chat a little bit. I wouldn't really say we chat about too many ideas. You know, we'll talk about opposition sometimes, but, um, you know, that's just sort of like that friendly, um, friendly face sort of thing. And, you know, we, we do speak, but... Um, yeah, that, that's probably the only person I really speak to away from the court often. I would like to speak to more people. You know, I, I always think that we should have, you know, more chats like this. You know, lockdown was amazing. It did teach us how to all use Zoom and, you know, what a great facility it is. Like, there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it more. But unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to happen. Okay. Uh, coach, 
like you, we could talk relaxing here to do this this or we'll edit this out one thing i meant to ask you was you don't have to do the mini pre presentation if you don't want to okay um, yeah and the, and the reason why is because basketball england now they want to they want to condense this a little okay. bit okay yeah that, that's fine that's fine so, so, i didn't really have much anyway like we right. you said about obviously putting like recruitment together and we touched on recruitment before so no, that, that's right. that's completely fine let's do this last let me do this edit then um, now, coach, uh, end of game questions. So four rapid fire questions, and these ones are always a little bit tougher. So favorite player to coach? Okay, I've obviously been thinking about this one. Um, in terms of favorite player, I've, I've got two that I have to say. Um, Lewis Sayers, who's now at Newcastle, um, is one of the most professional people that you'll ever come across. He just turns up day in, day out, gives you the same, whether he's having a great shooting day, bad shooting day, made mistakes, you just know what you're going to get with him. Um, you know, so consistent in his work ethic and those sort of things, I just think was was a huge benefit. And, you know, I'm glad to see him in Newcastle. I think that's a great opportunity for him to do really well, you know, against some, with some really experienced players like Fletch and Darius Defoe and those sort of guys, you know, I think that that's a great opportunity for him. So I'm super happy. Um, but also, I've got to put Parker Jackson Cartwright in there. Um, you know, we we took a sort of a, a calculated risk on bringing him in after he'd had a you know a fractured tibia the year before, and um, you know it just paid off. Like he was absolutely unbelievable. Um, you know, I'd, we he he missed one game last year because he had tonsillitis against London Lions, and we missed him so much that game. He was just like the heart and soul of the team. Um, could change a game on his own. Um, so good, so professional, um, never any attitude, just knew what to do at the right time. And yeah, them, them two guys are standout guys for me. Awesome. Uh, for, I'm putting these in different order. F favorite um, drill that you run? Um, I, I think I mentioned it before. I, I like the three on three closeout drill uh, where the defenders start on the baseline. Um, it's just, it's, you know, you're putting the def defenders at a disadvantage straight away and it's it's what happens in games all the time. You know, offense is there to, to try and create advantages for the offense. And as a defensive team, you have to you have to make the most of those situations and you know it's great. And just 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 describe that really quickly. I, I think in my mind I think I have an idea of what how it works, but Yeah, uh... so you've got two guys, one on each wing, and then there's an offensive guy at the top as well. Uh, three guys on the baseline facing those three guys. Ball starts in one corner, pass it out the top. The ball has to swing through all offensive guys. But the guy who started in the opposite corner runs cross court and he's on straight into a closeout. The middle defending guy at the baseline, he's going straight to the top. And the guy on the opposite wing on the baseline, he's going to be the help to come the help side. Yeah. And you know, you just you're just creating an advantage straight away. Talking about closeouts, which is a huge part of the game and staying on the floor, contesting shots, that type of thing, where we're going to force the offensive players. So yeah, that that for me is up there. Great and then there's, there's one of there's one other drill as well, which Burke got from Kevin Cadle. Um you can play it four and four or five and five and it's no dribble. You've got to make 10 passes before you can look to score. And it's just about defensive intensity. We re reward the defense uh, if they knock the ball out of bounds or backcourt. Defense get the ball, and they get to, get to become the offensive team. Yeah, th those are two of my favorites to run. Awesome. Uh, favorite all-time basketball coach. Um, I think there's a common theme with this one. I think you get the same name every time, and uh, it's no different for me. Um, Greg Popovich in the NBA uh, with the Spurs. I just think, you know, when you watch the Spurs, I think back in the day of like, you know, Duncan, Parker and Ginobili, like how they moved the ball. And, you know, he he started this whole sixth man thing with Ginobili. Bringing him off the bench could have been a starter in more or less any team in the NBA. Just team first sort of mentality, great movement offensively. You know, that, that, that to me is a standout coach. Awesome. And then favorite uh, go-to saying or statement? Um, I don't know. I, this one's a little bit tricky for me because I have a favorite saying myself. I've got it on a print um, downstairs. Um, my most common saying is, it is what it is. You know, I just like that one. You know, sometimes you just can't change certain things. Um, you know, 
if you get a call that you, you don't agree with it, it is what it is you just got to move on if something happens if you get an injury and you know it's devastating for the team it is what it is you just got to move on um, but my favourite saying and I've used it a few times used it in the cup final um, is a saying by Billie Jean King and it's pressure is a privilege um, I think it's you know you can interpret it in many ways the way I interpret it is you know yeah, we're, we're under pressure, we're under pressure to perform, but that's a privilege, you know, you've got to look at it, you know, you can't think of pressure as a negative, you know, you can't start shying away from pressure. The amount of people that would love to be in that position, to have that pressure on them, you've just got to see it as a privilege. Coach, um, again, I would like to really thank you for being on this uh, Time Out Coaching podcast. Um, you know, I want to wish you all of the success in this season, as crazy as the start has been. Um, yeah. You know, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, learn so much about you and your philosophy and, you know, some of the, you know, some really great observations there. Um, so thank you very much indeed from, from, from myself. No, no worries. Thank you very much for having me. Like I said at the start, um, you know, I think it's great what you're doing. I'm hearing stories from people that I don't know, you know, like Mark Dunning, I, I know of him, but I never knew this until you start bringing this to all our attention. And, you know, it, it's great. And, you know, long may it continue. And let's, let's hope that we do inspire that younger generation, like you said at the start. Appreciate that, coach. Thank you.